Welcome uh, everyone to the third director special colloquium of our 75th anniversary year, decarbonization within reach. Science and technology will play a crucial role in the fight against climate change. And Argonne and the other national laboratories are poised to contribute with broad and deep research expertise. We also play a key role in convening the right leaders to help us understand the most pressing challenges facing, facing our society today. And, it, and that is the intent of this morning's colloquium. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome our three guests today whose leadership in science, technology, public policy, and economics will demonstrate how these disciplines collectively can bring us closer to realizing the goal of a decarbonized economy by mid-century. Our keynote speaker today is Arun Majumdar, whose leadership over the years has helped us understand and take action towards the immense challenges posed by climate change. And we know the need is, is more urgent than ever to confront this crisis with the escalating effects of changing climate evidence across our country and around the globe, including record setting wildfires last year in the Western part of the US, the Southern deep freeze this past winter and this week's record setting heat in the Northwest. Varun has also been outspoken, outspoken about the historic opportunity we have to deliver the energy, energy innovations and technology solutions needed to address these challenges and create billions of new jobs. As you all know, the administration put forward an ambitious set of goals to cut our emissions in half by 2030, achieve 100% of clean energy, clean electricity, I should say, by 2035, and reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Realizing these goals will require an effective policy framework that will enable the deployment of existing technologies and the development of new breakthrough innovations. After Arun, we'll hear from Michael Greenstone, who has been at the forefront of helping policymakers quantify the long-term impacts of climate change and whose own research focuses on estimating the cost and benefits of environmental quality. We'll also hear from Kerry Dugan, whose place-based approach to energy policy has helped citizens solve urban, mobility, climate, and equity-related challenges. Together, Michael and Kerry will share their perspective on how we can drive the right policies to reduce carbon emissions, accelerate economic development, and improve the lives of those most impacted by climate change. To help us start the conversation, uh, let me now introduce Arun Majumdar, currently the J, the J Precourt uh, Provostial Chair Professor at Stanford University. Arun is a faculty member of the Departments of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science and engineering and a senior fellow and former director of the Precourt Institute for Energy. He is also a member of the Department of Photon Sciences at SLAC, the National Accelerator Laboratory. From 2009 to 2012, uh, he served as the founding director of ARPA-E and from 2011 to 2012, he was the acting undersecretary of energy. After leaving uh, Washington, Arun was the vice president for energy at Google, Arun is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He received his BS in Mechanical Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay, and a PhD from the University of California in Berkeley. After his address and a Q&A, we will have a panel discussion with Kerry Dugan and Michael Greenstone. Kerry is the CEO of a sustainability, a sustainability strategy firm, and Michael Greenstone uh, director of the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. Uh, Kaltar Afidi will serve as our moderator for this event. She is Argonne's Associate Laboratory Director for Physical Sciences and Engineering. I'm looking forward to the engaging discussions our speakers will have on our future in a decarbonized world. Uh, before Arun speaks, I want to express our gratitude for all the hard work of our colleagues here at Argonne and the strong support of you, the public, and our sponsors, really. Your support really enables Argonne to accelerate the science and technology that drives US prosperity and security. Together, we are unlocking the new frontiers in technology and securing America's energy future. It's now my honor to introduce Professor Arun Majumdar. Thank you, uh, Paul, um, for the very generous introduction and congratulations to all of Argonne National Lab for the 75th anniversary. Argonne, as we all know, has a very illustrious history um, in, uh, in science and engineering and is the birth of nuclear. And, uh, but 
right now there's so much more that is going on uh, at Argon with storage and um, the light source and everything else. So let me see if I could share my slides. Okay. So let me talk about energy and climate, which I call the defining issue of the 21st century. I'm gonna go first to a little bit of history. And it's important to understand why we are here today and why are we talking about climate change today? And this is obviously a long and complex issue. I'll try to explain this in four charts. The first is what I call the human tsunami. This is the population of the earth uh, over the last 10,000 years. You would see a few blips along the way, which are due to pandemics. They didn't have vaccinations at that time, but now we do. But nevertheless, what you see is an amazing rise in human population over the last mostly 200 years or so. And in the last 100 years has been absolutely phenomenal in sort of doubling the population every um, you know, 40, 50 years or so. This has had a huge consequence. The earth has never seen anything like this before in the past. But in addition to the human tsunami, there has been what I call the human consumption tsunami. And this is, I, I'm representing that in terms of uh, GDP per capita, which has also gone through an exponential rise. And, um, and if you take the GDP, that has gone through an even sharper rise. And of course, what we have seen over the last 100 years or so, people come out of poverty, improving the quality of lives. And, uh, and that is, that's all a good thing. But it, this has been enabled by a uh, energy consumption tsunami. And I'm putting this only over the last 200 years or so. And what I, I'm, and I'm depicting uh, some milestones when, for example, when I was born, uh, when my children were born, I was born in the 1960s, my children were born in the 1990s, my parents were born 1920s and 30s, my grandparents were born at the turn of the century, a little bit before that, and I'm moving the American Civil War. So in a matter of four generations, the energy consumption has skyrocketed. 80% of the primary energy are from fossil sources today. 90% of the energy is used via heat. And most people don't quite grapple with that, it's, but it's, uh, it's very important to understand that we are trying to not only decarbonize electricity, but we need to decarbonize heat as well. And of course, I don't have to tell this crowd that in because of the use of fossil sources, we have had a carbon dioxide tsunami. This is over about 10,000 years or so. And the rate at which CO2 is being emitted, the world has, the earth has never seen before. So this is the story, or this is the history of why we are here. And of course, if you, you know, people are now in the 21st century realizing that this is not sustainable in the 21st century. So as a result, you're seeing, so here's a little pop quiz as to how much time we have left. So this is a pop quiz. So one degree is the global average temperature rise before uh, the, from the pre-industrial level. Two degrees Celsius is uh, the Paris Agreement. And we're trying to keep our temperature rise, the global average temperature rise below two degrees. The next number is 800. And I'd like you to guess what this is. There are no, there's no grading out here. This is not 800 degrees Celsius, but this is the budget, 800 billion tons of CO2 that is left for the world to emit if you are to keep the temperature um, below two degrees Celsius. The next number is 40. And this is roughly, in fact, it's a little bit more, it's the 40 gigatons of CO2 per year that we're emitting from the earth. Just so you know, as a point of reference, how much is a billion tons, how much is a gigaton? If you add the weight of all 8 billion people on this earth, all the humans, the weight is about 0.6 gigatons and we're emitting 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. And the last number is 20. That means that's the ratio, you've got 20 years left. That's the urgency of the matter. The scale is gigatons. The urgency is the next two decades 
or maybe a little bit more. And where did the CO2 come from globally? It's electricity production, industry, transportation, agricultural, forestry, et cetera. So we have a massive change that is coming in the 21st century. And if you think that this is, um, you know, this is enough, here's some data which is really worrisome. The top paper is the measurements of CO2 emissions or absorption by the Amazon forest, and these are spot measurements, Amazon and the African tropical forest. And the bottom is the satellite measurements by NASA. And what we are finding is that at least the spot measurements are suggesting that the while the African forests are kind of net, you know, they are net absorbers as we think they are, the Amazon forests are slowly becoming a, a potentially a source of CO2. The satellite measurements by NASA, these are the carbon observatory satellites, these are suggesting even worse. They're saying these are now global measurements over the last, you know, over three years, 2015 to 2018, that the Amazon, both the Amazonian as well as the African tropical forest, which we have always considered in our models to be sinks of CO2, are now starting to be sources of CO2 as big as China. So the urgency of the matter is even more. And so if this is the defining challenge of the 21st century, because this is not electricity or gas, this is construction, this is steel, cement, this is transportation, agriculture, et cetera. And I would pose this, this, um, this idea out here that whatever 10 billion people consume will produce gigaton scale CO2 emissions because of 8 billion people. That's electricity, heating and cooling, transportation, food, textile. Textile is projected to be 10% of the emissions by 2050. Water, steel, cement, information the way we are using today. If you don't do something about the energy efficiency of computing, we are in trouble in terms of the amount of electricity that we will be using. So it is not a surprise that a lot of people are now feeling that this is not sustainable in the 21st century. The United Nations has come up with a net zero um, goal of sustainable development goals with net zero as, uh, asset owner alliance or the gold standard for commitments. The private sector has really committed to that. About 30% of the Fortune 500 companies have net zero emission goals. And the combined revenue of this 30% is about $11 trillion per year, which is more than um, half the US GDP. And this is growing. And if you ask the question to, to these corporations or the United, exactly how are we gonna get there? And the answer is, we don't really know. And there's a lot of work to be done in enabling not only the corporations and countries, but the whole world to get to this net zero goal. So the question is, how do we do that? Globally, this is calculations and, 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 and predictions and projections from both the IPCC. Here is a National Academy's report that if you are to keep below two degrees Celsius as a, as, a, as a world, we need to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions within the century. And that includes not only mitigation of CO2 emissions, that is reducing <clears throat> the emissions, but also negative emissions. And that's a very important fact. How do we get to negative emissions at the tens of gigaton scale? And this is going to be hard, uh, but nevertheless, you need both to get to net zero. This brings me to the US uh, energy and climate goals of the new administration. The left part of the chart out here are the emissions from EPA uh, data on transportation, electricity, industry, agriculture, and commercial and residential buildings. And the goal, as President Biden has proposed, is to get to a net zero emissions economy by 2050. And as Paul mentioned, 100% clean electricity by 2035. And as a marker for that, 80% clean electricity by 2030 and 50% emissions reductions, total emission reduction by 2030. The point being, the next decade is going to be extremely important I would say the next two decades. And President Biden has proposed that this has to be done, this transition has to be done 
with equity and environmental justice in mind, and to use this as an opportunity to create American jobs and infrastructure. So this is what we have in front of us today. So the question is, how do we get to 80% clean electricity by 2030? And, and what is, how do we get to 50% reduction in emissions by 2030? So there are, there's some good news. There's some breakthroughs that have happened. We are the world's largest producer of, of, of unconventional gas, and that has helped us transition from coal. For the first time in human history, renewable electricity at scale has become the cheapest way to produce electricity. And you're finding that solar uh, costs, which is the yellow circles, and the blue circles are the wind uh, production costs have come down below that of natural gas, which is the horizontal dash line in some parts of the country. And the, there's further cost reduction going on. So this is going to be an amazing opportunity to uh, inject renewable electricity onto our grid. And the third one <clears throat> is the cost of uh, lithium ion batteries, which has come down dramatic, even more dramatically than solar and wind. And we feel that within the next few years, we are going to reach a pack um, cost of $100 a kilowatt hour. And that milestone is very important. And that is because at that cost, $100 a kilowatt hour, uh, electric vehicle like a car will become cost and range competitive with a gasoline car without any subsidies. And so if you look at the gamut of all these things, it is tectonic shifts in the industry going on simultaneously. And this is all good news. The point is that given the Biden administration's goals and the uh, ability to keep, or the goal to keep below two degrees Celsius, this is necessary, but certainly not sufficient. We need much more multi-day grid scale storage at about $10 a kilowatt hour. I'll get into more of this in a, in a minute. Small modular nuclear plants at half the cost that we have today, refrigerants to be uh, at zero global warming potential. We spend a lot of time in, in reducing the energy consumption of buildings, um, but in the zero net energy building, how about zero net cost so it can scale? I'll talk a little bit about industrial heat and decarbonizing food and really a gigaton scale carbon management scheme and opportunity. And this is still needs to be done. Just uh, I'll spend a little bit of time on this 80% carbon free electricity. In 2020, given that it was a little unusual year, nevertheless, the electricity demand was about 4,000 terawatt hours. If you take a 1% growth in electricity uh, by 2030, it's going to be about 4,500 terawatt hours or so. So 80% carbon free electricity by 2030 is about 3,500 terawatt hour. The question is, how do we produce that? What's the state today? So today, this is on the, on the top chart is the power capacity. That is the gigawatts of coal, natural gas, nuclear, solar, wind, um, hydro, biomass, and geothermal. This is most of US electricity production. And the bottom chart is the electricity produced in terawatt hours from coal, natural gas, et cetera. And, and what you can see right away, and if you take if you find the capacity factor, how much of that is being used, you find that coal and natural gas is about 40%. And you got to see nuclear, 93% capacity factor. Solar is only 22%. Wind is 33, hydro, biomass, geothermal, the small numbers in terms of terawatt hours, but reasonable uh, capacity factor. But it's important to note Solar and wind doesn't have that high capacity factor, which needs to be increased. And the question is, can we retain nuclear? That's a 93% capacity factor. So if you are to change this and you go, you know, aggressive deployment in solar and wind, which we really should be looking at. And if you can increase the capacity factor from 22%, maybe 25 or 30%, I think that'll be terrific. There's a business as usual. This is a blue curve on the, on the left-hand side. The business as usual growth uh, in capacity um, for solar. And there's an aggressive deployment 
of about 700 gigawatts total by 2030 and 1500 terawatt hours. So it'll be anywhere from you know, about 900 terawatt hours to about 1500 and with a capacity factor of 25%. If you look at the wind growth, uh, that's likely to grow as well. So let us say we go aggressively into solar and wind, what do we get? Again, this is the today's terawatt hours in 2020 in terms of coal, natural gas, et cetera. And let us say we go full blast into solar and wind. And I've called this the, the 10X solar because you go you know, 10 times more solar than what it is today and about uh, almost uh, two and a half times that of wind as we have today. And we retain nuclear as it is today. I hope we can grow, but let us say at the very least we can retain. You find that if you really want to produce 80% carbon free, we still have to use a little bit of natural gas and we have to capture the carbon from that. Some of it could be carbon you know, without any CCS, but we need to uh, capture some of the carbon, otherwise we can't get there. And you need the natural gas to provide stability for the grid. And I'm reducing coal dramatically. If you reduce coal to zero, let's say, then you would need to produce more electricity from natural gas with carbon capture sequestration. Unless you go 12X solar, which is the really the aggressive one. And if you do that, you still need uh, carbon capture from natural gas and CCS from natural gas. So the bottom line, the key messages I would leave you with, and I'll say a little bit about what else is going on, is that we, if you are to really reduce economy-wide, we need a direct price on carbon or an indirect price of carbon, which is the clean energy standards that President Biden has, has proposed, either a direct or indirect price. And it has to be largest number because otherwise you won't see change, fundamental changes in the infrastructure. A huge focus on energy efficiency <clears throat> to reduce the total demand in buildings and industry, et cetera. Preserve current nuclear. That should be one of the biggest issues that I hope the administration takes up and try <clears throat> adding new nuclear uh, in terms of small modular nuclear plants. Aggressive deployment in solar and wind and while that is important, also the transmission electricity infrastructure, as well as the RDND for long haul duration storage, natural gas with CCS for balancing the grid, and RDND to reduce CO2 capture cost from point sources and the atmosphere because we need negative emissions, and carbon management infrastructure at the gigaton scale. And finally, I'll say a little bit about hydrogen production infrastructure in use for hard debate sectors. And this is a just transit. We cannot leave anyone behind in this transition. We've got to invest in globally competitive clean energy supply chains that are emerging right now and figuring out how to align and use the buying power of the federal state and the private sector for creating local US demand. Very quickly, in June, uh, early June, uh, Secretary Granholm launched the First earth shot, which is the hydrogen shot. Question is why hydrogen? It is clearly, we need a fuel in addition to electricity, clean electricity. Just to give it quick, the target is a dollar a kilogram. 95% of today's hydrogen comes from natural gas. We use the natural gas pipeline infrastructure. And in the local plants and steam methane reforming, we use steam. But for every hydrogen kilogram that we produce, we produce 10, kilograms of CO2, and the cost is about a dollar a kilogram of hydrogen. If you capture the CO2, we turn gray hydrogen into blue hydrogen, the cost is about $1.60 or so, but we need a CO2 pipeline infrastructure. This is very exciting. Of course, the green hydrogen, where we take electricity and we use that to split water. We need a lot of energy to split water. And today's cost is about three to five, maybe $6 a kilogram, and that cost needs to be brought down through RD. And finally, this is a new emerging technology of natural gas to use natural gas for pyrolysis to produce solid carbon or fibers. Um, and that is potentially a dollar a kilogram hydrogen. I'm putting the infrastructure on the left hand side because 
we are unlikely to get hydrogen pipelines for bulk hydrogen transport because we still don't understand hydrogen embrittlement. So we have to think some other way of moving hydrogen, possibly in the form of ammonia. And we have a huge infrastructure to produce ammonia, mainly for fertilizers. So this is a very important fact. And we, if you are to use CCS or carbon capture from, from natural gas, from steam methane reforming, we need CO2 pipelines as well. Carbon capture, this is, uh, I'll say very briefly, <clears throat> from coal-fired power plant, it's about 60 to $70 a ton. A gas fired is about 90. Direct air capture anywhere from 400 to $600 a ton because it's more dilute. Can we, and this is the 45Q, which is at about 30 to $50 a ton of CO2. And we either need 45Q to be elevated, to be increased, or we need, and frankly, and we need R&D to reduce the cost of carbon capture by making more energy efficient carbon capture. And so this is a R&D plus a deployment issue because we need pipelines as well. Lastly, long duration grid scale storage. As we inject more solar and wind into the grid, and this is what I call the Tesla Edison architecture of the grid, which was never designed for fluctuating generation. As we inject more, we will need more and more long duration storage. So the blue curve is, the x-axis is the percentage of solar and wind. The blue curve is the, the duration of the storage each time. And so if you see 80%, we will, 80% penetration, we will need about 100 hours at a time, maybe use it four or five times a year. And the cost requirement for storage comes down dramatically. This is a log chart on the, on the y-axis out here. And so the question is, Today, where is lithium-ion battery? It's somewhere out there. If you look at the bare minimum cost of lithium-ion battery, maybe about $50, $60 a kilowatt hour. This is where pumped hydro and compressed air storage is. And this is where we need to go if you are to really look at long duration storage. And we know there's RPE programs going on on thermal, electrochemical, and hydrogen-based storage, but this is still an R&D topic right now. And I know Jay Caesar at Argonne is doing a lot of work in this area. So again, let me just leave you with the key messages on carbon pricing and policy, on energy efficiency, on nuclear, on solar and wind and infrastructure development and long duration storage, CCS and natural gas for balance in the grid, at least for this decade before we get the storage solutions there. And <clears throat> a massive program on CO2 capture and carbon management and hopefully some hydrogen production cost production and greenhouse gas free, as well as infrastructure as well. And again, with a just transition, investing in globally competitive supply chains and aligning the buying power from federal, state and private sector to create the local demand. So let me stop here and I'm happy to answer some questions. Thank you, Arun. This is actually, I was, taking notes as fast as I could. <laughs> Very informative work. We really appreciate your perspective on decarbonization. So we have a number of questions actually coming in during your talk. Um, so we'll choose a few of them now and then we can have a, a longer Q&A later in our program. So to ask a question, although many of you already did, please use the Q&A feature by clicking on the Q&A icon. We'll respond to as many questions as time allows. So, okay, the first question, Arun, is uh, do we have enough natural resources such as lithium and rare earth metals to enable the massive growth needed for these technologies? What about the environment effect for extracting and manufacturing these? It's a great question. <clears throat> for lithium, <clears throat> we do have... Um, we do have resources not only in the brine um, solutions and the in the lakes that are found around the world, which is the cheapest way to extract lithium. We have a lot of lithium in the oceans, but of course more dilute. And there is research going on, um, uh, not just at Stanford that I know of, but other places, to reduce the cost of lithium extraction from from ocean water. So I think yes, there is lithium and and uh, cobalt and nickel, which are the two other battery materials 
they are they're co-developed and they, they are co-produced with other mining operations, mostly in other parts of the world, in Africa, et cetera. And that, I think I would say that we need, we need some kind of rd and to figure out how to do that in the United States and other locations. But I, I would use this opportunity to also talk about a circular economy. We need to emphasize recycling of these batteries and extraction of these materials, of these elements from the existing battery stock, which will, which will essentially become waste at the end. And given the scale at what we're talking about, that is absolutely essential. So, and that needs to be done. And that is not an, today, not an energy efficient process. We need to make those recycling processes more energy efficient and, and hopefully without any greenhouse gas emissions. Otherwise we are back in the treadmill of carbon. So I would emphasize, uh, I think there is, there are resources. We have to be careful how we extract them in terms of environmental impact, but use this option of developing a circular economy, recycling with energy efficient and clean energy operations. Thank you, Arun. Um, I think we have time for another question. Uh, is it practical to invest in methods to make our fossil fuel system more sustainable during the transition to green energy? Or should we be focusing research and resources solely on developing green technology? Investing in, in metals? Did, did I hear that right? Methods, methods to, to make- Oh, methods. Fuel. Yeah. Should we do yeah. something about our fossil fuel? you know, production system to make it more sustainable during this transition? Yeah. So I, I would say that this is not the time to do either and or. This is the time to look at and. We, there's no question long-term, we have to get our fossil fuel or capture the carbon and make sure that it's greenhouse gas. There are no GHG emissions from that. But we are unlikely to get our fossil fuel in the next decade. We will have to use fossil fuel in this transition, at least for the next, I believe, two decades or so. And I made the case that we will likely be using natural gas because we have to balance the grid and we have to stabilize the grid, but we need to do carbon capture. So I think making the processes uh, more efficient, but I would also add making sure that they are they're emission free in addition to making more efficient, um, and then helping this transition go along um, and to a net zero emissions economy, which is what I think everyone's trying to do within this century, and at least for the United States by 2050. Thank you. Um, we can have another one. So a carbon tax and its cousin, cap and trade, have not been politically feasible in most of the world. Is there another option to consider that would have a major impact? Well, we have a terrific uh, proponent or, or an expert on that, which is Michael Greenstone, who is, uh, who is gonna come online soon. Um, I, I would certainly uh, ask him that question. I, I think there's, there are two ways of doing it. One is the uh, carbon tax or what uh, James Baker and, and George Schultz, the two former secretaries have proposed called the Baker Schultz, is a revenue neutral carbon tax which will collect the revenues from a carbon tax and give it back to the people. So it's not a fiscal drag on the economy and um, it's a progressive tax. So that's one model. And there is an economy-wide federal and, and that works when the markets work. And there are many places the markets work and it needs to be at least $50 to be able to make it, you know, make it in account. Um, but there are places where, the, where there are market failures and we have known this energy efficiency, for example, uh, where the price changes don't really induce behavioral changes. And there we probably need some regulatory standards like appliance, uh, appliance standards or whole building standards. The other model that the president and his team have proposed is clean energy standards, and which is gives the states more options and, and they can choose from a menu of how to reduce the carbon emissions and, and that thereby reach the GHG goals in addition to the United States reaching its, uh, through the states. So it would come to a state federal option as well. 
and I think this is a matter of debate, frankly, which way we should be going. And, and there will be debate on this as we get into the next few years of discussion. Hopefully we can come to a conclusion soon. Hopefully it'll be a combination of the two and, and people can pick and choose. But I think this is something where Michael Greenstone really is an expert on the, on the carbon tax versus uh, clean energy standards. I didn't even mention cap and trade because that is the other option um, that should be discussed as well. Thank you. I would say one last question. So is the goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050 in the US enough to prevent detrimental effects of climate change? How about global net zero carbon emission goals? Yeah, I mean, if I, I showed, I flashed the chart from the National Academy's report, that says that the world has to get to net zero by within this century by, um, by uh, 2090 or so. But I think it's, this is not just a US thing, as we all know, this is, you know, China has committed to a net zero by 2060. I think it's gonna be harder for China given the amount of coal that they have, um, that they have, uh, you know, uh, the amount of electricity that they're getting out of coal, amount of heating that they get out of coal. And India, which has got 80% of the electricity coming from coal, they'll have even harder. So yes, I think this is going to be a collective uh, approach to things. Um, we have to get to by the end of this century, by, as I said, 2060 or so. I, I think let, let's make sure that we understand that the 2050 goal is an ambitious goal. Let's not sugarcoat. This is going to be hard for the United States to get there because this is a shift of almost the whole economy going to a clean economy. And, and we have to work at it. But the opportunity to go at 2050 also gives you the opportunity to create the supply chain and the infrastructure for the 20th century, which will make the US more globally competitive. And I think that's the opportunity we should be looking at as well. Thank you. Thank you, Arun, very much. I appreciate uh, your insight. So thank you all for your questions. I'm, I'm happy we ask more questions than, than expected. Thank you, Arun. So it's time to keep our program moving. Um, now I would like to transition to our panel discussion on the promise of collaboration. I'm very excited to bring uh, in Kerry Dugan and Michael Greenstone for this discussion. Let me introduce Kerry Dugan. Kerry is CEO of sustainability strategy firm, Sustainability. She is also currently a member of the board of directors of Permafix Environmental Services and the advisory boards of several environmental organizations. This year, she was appointed to the State of Michigan Council on Climate Solutions. Kerry was also a co-founder of the Smart City Labs, served on advisory boards of the University of Michigan Herb Institute for Global Sustainable Enterprise, and lead many other professional activities. Before these roles, she was deputy director for policy to then Vice President Joe Biden for energy, environment, climate, and distressed communities. She also held several senior roles in the US Department of Energy, including in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, as Director of Stakeholder Engagement, Director of Legislative, Regulatory and Urban Affairs, and as Senior Policy Advisor. Kerry earned her Bachelor in Environmental Studies from the University of Vermont and her Master in Natural Resource Policy and behavior from the University of Michigan. So the question for you, Kerry, is a solution to the 21st century most pressing problem is multifaceted, multinational, global. What do you see as the greatest barrier in the policy, economic, and science and technology realms? Way to start with a just a softball there. Um, and thank you for having me at Argonne. It's good to be back uh, with friends. I'm in the Midwest um, uh, dialing in from Detroit today. So waving across the lake. Um, gosh, so Arun clearly laid out, you know, a lot of the technical challenges. And um, as you said in the introduction, and thank you for that kind introduction, 
part of my background actually is in behavior change. And I think there was a question in the chat around that. So for from my viewpoint, um, while I've done uh, the high flying lofty policy, I really look at how we get this done on the ground and in place um, and how it gets delivered. And I would offer in particular how this gets um, uh, you know, a 21st century climate resilient set of infrastructure across all bear, you know, all sets, how it gets done in an equitable fashion. So um, I'll be talking a little bit about that, what I kind of describe as slingshot. I used to use the word leapfrog. Um, those of you at Argonne who I worked with um, when I was still in service will remember me using the term leapfrog of place into um, world-class technology born out of our wonderful DOE national labs. But now, because there's a really um, an understanding that we need to center equity as we deploy, I think um, I, I use the term slingshot because the new normal is not obviously what we need to go back to economically. But um, that's that's where my head is, um, and I think you can also see uh, reflected a little bit in the Biden Harris policies as they've really centered um, policy around Justice 40 in addition to uh, trying to make these breakthroughs that Arun alluded to. So hopefully that will help us get started. Thank you, Kerry. Um, next, uh, let me introduce Michael Greenstone. Michael is the Milton Friedman Distinguished Service Professor in Economics, as well as the director of the Becker Friedman Institute an interdisciplinary energy policy institute at the University of Chicago. He previously served as a chief economist for President Barack Obama, Council of Economic Advisors. Formerly, he was a 3M professor of environmental economics at MIT and directed the Hamilton Project, which produces evidence-based policy proposals and analysis to promote brand-based economic growth. As a co-director of the Climate Impact Lab, he is producing empirically grounded estimates of the local and global impacts of climate change. He also created the Air Quality Life Index that converts air pollution concentrations into their impact on life expectancy and co-founded Climate Vault, a not-for-profit that uses markets to allow institutions and people to reduce their carbon footprint. Greenstone received a PhD in economics from Princeton University and a bachelor in economics with high honors from Swarthmore College. So the question is, as developed countries move to renewable energy and low carbon energy, fossil energy, including oil, natural gas and coal could become very cheap. This could lead to the shift of these energy sources into less developed countries with affordable energy to improve their living standard. But with severe climate change consequences, what measures should the global community take to prevent leakage of fossil energy from developed countries to less developed ones? Uh, yes, like Carrie. Uh, so thank you very much for the generous uh, invitation. And like Carrie, I'll just note you're not starting with easy questions. Um, you know, I and I will talk about it a little bit more uh, a, a, as we go along. But I think this question, which I like to think of as a global energy challenge, which is how every society around the world, uh, the United States, India, China, uh, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Bangladesh, et cetera, are, have to find a way to balance between several goals. Uh, and those goals are uh, how to have access to inexpensive and reliable sources of energy, uh, how to avoid disruptive climate change, uh, and how to avoid uh, the uh, health effects associated with the use of uh, fossil fuels. And uh, the question of, uh, well, the world is endowed with tons and tons of fossil fuels, uh, and uh, it, isn't someone going to use them? I, I take that as your question. Uh, and I think uh, the likely answer is, uh, yes, they're going to be used uh, unless we get the kind of innovation uh, that can bring, uh, that uh, brings low carbon energy sources uh, so that they're real, fully competitive. Uh, with fossil fuels. Uh, and in many parts of the world, that, that is not the case yet. Uh, and so I think 
it underscores a centrality. It's you know, special to celebrate Argonne's 75th anniversary, but it underscores the centrality of the kind of innovation that the DOE labs uh, certainly are an important part of. Uh, you know, another approach would be to try and uh, provide incentives for those countries uh, not to use fossil fuels. I think it's very hard uh, politically to think about directly sending money to developing countries, but by funding R&D, R&D, &D, as the word said, uh, with the last year for demonstration, that, that might be a way to do that that is more politically feasible. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for your insight. Um, so now let's bring Aaron back into the discussion and I invite all panelists to turn on your cameras. I have prepared questions for our panel discussion and if the audience has others, please submit them uh, using the Q&A feature. So now let's get started. Hopefully you all can see this. It's just a really short um, orientation, at least to how I, I'm thinking about uh, today's conversation and again huge congrats to Argon 75 years um, and um, great Midwestern lab as I said. So this is just a little bit about me in terms of uh, where I come from. I rarely talk about my specific degree but I think in the context of this conversation I underline the and behavior portion of my education because I am um, uh, I am like I said, working at high level policy and I have, that is the degree, that is the work, but I'm really more interested in how it gets done and operationalized. So um, in my own practice right now, I am considered a connector and change agent. Some some former dean of a, of a, of a school nearby gave me that moniker and it stuck with me. Um, what that really means is that I, I work on policy, I work on practical policy and translation. Um, and for these purposes, I'm always considered myself just technical enough to be dangerous, uh, especially given my time at the Department of Energy um, at an ERE, which was mentioned in the intro. So um, I come with a warning that I often am accused of being real when I give public remarks. And so um, again, born out of uh, doing the ground game, if you will, both uh, politically and in deployment. Um, so while some folks are, you know, screaming about polar bears in the past and then today, and uh, I live in Detroit, so the conversation at this moment is my basement is flooded. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about what, what things look like on the ground. Um, Arun has seen me present before. He knows I always like to throw in a funny picture in my presentations. Um, for many years, I've had that song playing in my head, No One to Hold Them. You all know that song. Um, I've been playing poker with my family for a long time. And so I've learned from a very early age, that's me with the circles, that uh, you play the cards you're dealt. And unfortunately, my generation, my kids, and the ones coming after me have been dealt a tough set of cards with respect to climate change. And unfortunately, we don't get to throw these cards back. We are stuck on the same planet. So I'm a bit of a realist in terms of um, how things get done. This is my main slide, the approach that I take. Um, and I think, again, this is reflected. Um, you have my history um, and my advice to the now president has always been, you throw on your economic development hat, no matter where you're coming from. So I was deployed myself into the city of Detroit before, during and after it's very infamous bankruptcy to work on deployment. Um, I was told to go there with an economic development hat on which I thought was curious because I was coming from the Department of Energy and I didn't it didn't quite compute at the time but now looking back I clearly get it that was my job through a lens of jobs and through a lens of justice and so this is my summary slide I think of sort of the Biden Harris approach too but um, uh, that's my fun little icon and my key takeaways uh, piggybacking on a lot of what you heard from Arun um, in terms of what we talk about leapfrogging I call it slingshot there's the new normal cannot be the old normal. There are communities that have been exposed through this pandemic about just how bad things were. Um, and so my, in my mind, you know, we're not just trying to take people from where they are to world class. There's folks who have not participated in, in the economy that need to come on this journey. And I think that's really reflected in the Biden-Harris um, Justice 40 platform. Um, so just know that I lead with that. Um, from my time in the Obama um, Biden White House, we, I remember we put out statements calling things it's time for bold investment. I, I, I think we do see that with the uh, uh, the AJP, the American Jobs Plan, but I do think we need to fold in some creativity. I myself, you know, good federal uh, servant, um, did some disruption during my time in service, and I do think that creativity 
um, that using that, you know, both sides of our brains, both the technical side and um, the new partnerships and the atypical and the strange bed follows, I think it's going to take all of that. And in some cases, I do literally mean in engaging the arts and really trying to meet people where they are. Um, Arun said this in his remarks too about, it, you know, this is sort of everyone's job. I believe, you know, uh, where you can, uh, you have certain assets, certainly um, the lab and all the delightful folks I've met along the way at the lab um, are technically sharp. You do need chief integration officers. That's a new term of art that I've been noodling on uh, to get us outside of our silos of excellence. It's really easy to just focus on you know, narrowly on what we work on, but there is a real world outside that these need these technologies deployed at scale and quickly. Arun mentioned um, RDD and D. He knows I like to flip it around and try to focus on deployment and deploying what works while we continue to innovate ourselves out of this problem. And then finally, whole of economy um, is a conversation. So it's not just um, green jobs anymore. Every job needs to be a green job and we need to think about it and also speak to people's real kitchen table economics. Um, so that's my soapbox for today. That's my orientation. I just thought I would put it up on a slide presentation for the audience so you can know Kind of what I'm about. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, now we can uh, move on to Michael, please. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna, you know, it's not easy going after Kerry or Arun, uh, and uh, I think we probably, the three of us, see a lot of uh, similarities in the world. And so I just wanted to maybe elaborate on some of the points that came up uh, in their presentations uh, and in the discussion you had with Arun. Uh, and uh, one way I just wanted to describe what I think is, what I think of as kind of, I mentioned in my answer to question a moment ago, the global energy challenge. And I, I feel like there's kind of put together a series of facts that might help uh, make this a little bit more challenging or a little, little bit more tangible, sorry. So the, the first fact, uh, I think, that is really, as countries try to navigate and societies try to navigate the need for inexpensive and reliable energy with avoiding disruptive climate change and avoiding the health effects of, associated with burning coal and particulates pollution, uh, is the really shocking disparities uh, in energy consumption around the world. And, you know, sometimes numbers get stuck in my head. So here's a number that's been stuck in my head. The United States has about 300 million people, maybe 325 million people. Uh, the average person in the U.S. consumes about 13,000 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. Uh, that is like way off the charts relative to where lots of the rest of the people on the planet live. Uh, you know, in China, it's four or 5,000 now. They have 1.4 billion people. In India, it's which is almost 1.4 billion people as well. It's maybe about a thousand kilowatt hours on average. And in the state of Bihar, which is in India, is like 200 kilowatt hours per person per year. So they're like compared to the U.S., they're off by factor 65. Okay, and so that's not just numbers; those are extraordinary differences in the way people's lives are conducted. Uh, buried in there is like when the hot summer temperatures come. Uh, lots of misery, you know, it's just unpleasant, but also lots of death associated with uh, not, not having cooling. Uh, and so that's like a totally unacceptable state of affairs if you live in Bihar and if you live in India and probably in many parts of China as well. Uh, and that's why when you see the projections of what's going to happen, there's no doubt there's going to be lots of continued energy growth uh, around the world. So you just got to start with that. There's going to be a lot more energy demand. The developed countries will probably be flat. The developing countries are just going to grow and grow and grow. And there's reasons to think even this green line is an underestimate. Uh, the second fact is you're trying to think about how can we solve the global energy challenge uh, is uh, there really have been remarkable reductions uh, in clean energy costs. I, I think reductions, I'd be curious to get Arun's uh, take on this, but reductions that I think if you'd predicted them in uh, a decade ago, you people might have thought you were a little bit off. Uh, and these very large reductions in solar, uh, important reductions, not as large, important reductions in wind, and then kind of shocking declines uh, in lithium ion battery packs, uh, which have brought electric vehicles, uh, you know, 
into the discussion in a meaningful way. Uh, but fact three is even with all those improvements, uh, we still remain in a world where in most parts of the world, fossil fuels remain less uh, expensive. And I, in parentheses there, I put ignoring externalities. And so here I put the price of natural gas this is in the United States uh, uh, producing a kilowatt hour of electricity. Think of it as you know, four or five cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and then these bars, the stripe bars are, uh, well, what would be the cost of producing a kilowatt hour of electricity this is from building a new plant? with wind onshore, solar, or wind offshore, but using natural gas as a backup. Uh, and you can see wind is getting pretty close, uh, but solar and wind offshore are still much more expensive. And of course, these have involved the release of greenhouse gases uh, when you have natural gas backups. Uh, a new nuclear plant is maybe twice as expensive. Uh, and then if you use battery backups, even with all the advances in batteries, uh, that, that's even more expensive. So. The system that does not price externalities uh, is pushing us to using fossil fuels. Uh, and that's true in the United States. We're a very rich country. Uh, in other parts, and you know, probably we can afford uh, these more uh, expensive sources, and we can afford these more expensive sources of energy. But just think back to Bihar, like, and try and explain the idea that today they should spend two or three times as much on electricity. And that's, it's gonna be a hard sell. Uh, that's in the power sector and transport. Uh, we're making such great progress, uh, but it is, and this should be updated because the current price of crude is actually uh, much higher than $40, probably now $70. But uh, we're at the place where by my estimates, uh, given today's battery prices, you would need a break-even price of oil, the, uh, the, the price of oil that would make an electric vehicle and an internal combustion engine vehicle uh, equal cost over their lifetime, uh, you would still need the break-even price of oil to be uh, substantially higher than I think we've probably ever seen and you know more than twice as high as it is today. So without pricing externalities, uh, fossil fuels uh, still remain much less expensive. And then this was like embedded in what the room was saying, but I, I always find this graph, as many times I look at it, just kind of awe-inspiring, not really in the good way. But here's our, uh, the pathway we would have to be, here's emissions, uh, global emissions uh, of CO2 uh, historically, and that's the black line. And then here's what would have to happen to them in the coming decades if we were going to get on a two degrees pathway. Uh, and you know, there's no historical record for such sharp declines. It's not to say it can't happen, but as Arun was underscoring, this is a big, big lift for the United States, it's a big, big lift uh, for the world. Uh, and just to underscore for the world, like uh, these are uh, project the share of emissions uh, in 2020, uh, the United States' share, China's share, and the rest of the world's share. Uh, and then in the blue is 2015, 2100. And so what you, I just want to make the point, like, as hard as a difficult time as we're having, uh, we're going to need, it's not going to work unless the rest of the world comes along. And again, we're effectively going to need the rest of the world. That is lots of places uh, where there's uh, very low current levels of energy consumption to increase their energy consumption and do it in a way that have, uh, you know, much less greenhouse gas intensive uh, uh, sources of energy. Um, if we want to take stock of where we are with policy in the U.S., you know, I think a fair description is it's pretty piecemeal. Uh, lots of taking on individual sectors or individual sources of greenhouse gases uh, and done in a pretty expensive way. Uh, like if you compare it to what the Biden administration's interim social cost of carbon is, I, I think that number is too low. I think they will adjust it up. Uh, but the costs for many other, most of the policies we're doing tend to be higher. Uh, and that's just in the US, I think uh, globally, the average carbon price is about two and a half dollars. Uh, the Biden administration 
interim social cost of carbon might suggest it should be at least $50. Uh, we're continuing to have a hard time of ramping up energy R&D globally. Uh, you know, it's not near the levels of what, sorry, the x-axis has disappeared, but it's not near the levels that it was in the 70s. Uh, and so like all of this sounds a little bit gloomy, uh, but now let me, I wanna, I don't wanna end on a gloomy note, let me end on a kind of more positive note. Uh, recently, and I'm sure we'll wanna talk about this, there have been uh, a series of policy commitments uh, from key actors around the world about when they're going to their countries will become uh, carbon neutral, uh, and lots of the world is gray here with no commitment. But a lot where a lot of the energy is projected to come from is actually there's color, and so here you can see, uh, you know, China is about twenty percent of world emissions. They've made a twenty sixty pledge. Uh, and you can see what other countries have done here. So you could see kind of a pathway to this. Uh, really strong, robust commitments. We're not uh, we're not there yet. I think the Biden administration really it's opening a new day, uh, especially compared to the last five years. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of work uh, to be done, and I, I look forward to uh, talking about that with Carrie and uh, Arun. Thank you, Michael. That's a very very helpful information. Uh, seeing all those numbers. Um, Okay, so now let's bring Arun back into the discussion and I invite all panelists to turn on your cameras. We have uh, prepared questions and also additional from uh, the audience. Uh, now let's get started. So the first question is, uh, can we get to the goal of zero net carbon emission by 2050 by simply implementing the science and technology breakthroughs for example, in energy storage, photovoltaics, and wind power that have already been discovered. Are there some game changers that are in the wings? So I will let the panel volunteer to answer this question. Oh, can I just clarify the question? Is this about the United States or the world? Well, we can start by United States. I think we are leading the world, so. <laughs> uh, but maybe, you know, whatever perspective, you know, you can- And the question is if we freeze technology of what we have today? Yes, do we, do we have what is needed now just by implementing what the knowledge we have, the breakthroughs we have in, in energy storage, uh, photovoltaic, um, can we get to net zero emission by 2050 or are there other, uh, some game cha uh, changers that are in the wings, so. I think that I, I would like a room to really weigh in, but the answer is no. <laughs> That's my, my I, view. I, the answer is no, not even close. I would agree with, with Michael. I, I think clean electricity, we have, you know, uh, we need to certainly deploy solar and wind. There's no question about it at a scale that is 10 to 12x or maybe 15x over the next 20 years. Um, and that technology is there and it's improving. But as Kerry pointed out, there's a ground game to be played. These infrastructure projects are non-trivial because it's not just the technology, it is the permitting, the siting, alignment of state policies to federal policies and making sure you have the right of way for a transmission line. This is the ground game that Kerry was talking about. And it is so important to get that right in addition to the technology. But if you are, as I mentioned, we don't have the low cost storage technology for long duration storage. We don't have it. So we, we are going to make do with natural gas and with carbon capture partially to be able to ramp up and down. I wish it's, there was a question on nuclear. I wish nuclear could be turned into ramping because you, when you do have injection of massive amounts of solar and wind, you need ramping capability up and down. And that ramping can be done with natural gas turbines today, combined cycle at 60% plus efficiency. We should be able to do the ramping with nuclear and then you have a possibility. But for a net zero economy about 2050, it's not just electricity. It is a lot of other things. And, and I think the hard to abate sectors like cement and steel, agriculture, et cetera, you do need other 
technologies, and those are not yet cost effective, hydrogen being one of them, and they're not cost effective when you're trying to do it in a greenhouse gas freeway. And so I think you need that the balance between deployment, absolutely, but also R&D and, and demonstration with the private sector to bring down and then de-risk the technology for to make it bankable in the future for the financial community. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, please, Carrie, you want to add a comment on that? No, I knew that everyone was going to answer that perfectly, but emphasizing like the difficulty with uh, which it is to deploy uh, in those sectors that Arun mentioned, it should be emphasized. Um, if, if this was easy, it'd be done already. Um, and that's just uh, the truth of it. But I will point you to, I mean, uh, Michael's presentation was great, trying to leave on some positive notes here. Um, Arun's leadership and uh, during Sunshot is a great example, the team that coalesced around a really important goal. And then you saw in Arun's presentation, the Secretary Granholm's new Earth Shots. I mean, it's really having goals like that, that folks um, can harmonize around, as Arun said, federal, state, local folks. Um, you've got folks on the ground. Remember, that's my orientation. I'm on the ground looking up. These folks are dealing with a fire hose of issues in leadership positions across you know, different cities and, and places. So where you can coalesce around a really finite goal, I think that helps. But uh, to your point, absolutely deploy what works and innovate, innovate, innovate. And that's where having great partners at Argonne um, is really important. So thanks. Thank you. And actually this is a good thing. Can I just come back to that? Like the deployment, the problem with the deployment is, uh, there's no, a lot of these technologies are not cost competitive currently. Uh, and so it needs a policy because of the policy backbone or infrastructure or lack of backbone or infrastructure. And so, uh, you know, you can't just deploy it. Someone's got to pay for it. Uh, and uh, either policy is going to get people to pay for that or we're not going to do it is kind of my view. Uh, no one's just going to adopt more expensive sources of energy because uh, very few people are willing to do that. How about that? And again, I, I, I do worry a little bit about like the U.S. focus, which was I meant to really drive home in my presentation. Uh, yeah, we can. I, sometimes I worry that we have kind of, uh, and this is with all due respect to uh, Arun's beloved home state of California, that we kind of have a California view of the world. And uh, I know this is not a Arun's view, but many of my friends in California kind of think, well, if we could just green the grid in California, global global climate change would be solved. Uh, and I think Arun probably has friends who think that too. Uh, and it's like so far away from reality. Uh, just come, let's come back to Bihar. Uh, uh, you know, that's like more than 100 million people. It's like a third of the United States population living with 200 kilowatt hours per year. Not acceptable to them. And there's nothing you're going to do or say, we could do or say, that's going to change your mind about that. Okay. So I could just endorse that view. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Um, I think the, I mean, what Michael pointed out is the global view is critically important. There are many countries that need to grow the need to bring people out of poverty and call it a global environmental justice issue. And, and we need to, uh, in fact, in many ways, an aggressive net zero goal for the United States or Japan or Europe would allow, and that's, it's important that the countries that put out most of the CO2 in the atmosphere need to go early so that it allows the other countries to grow the economy and bring people out of poverty into improved quality of life that we enjoy. So I think there's a global environmental justice issue, which I think should not be forgotten. And Michael's absolutely right. And I'll come in just, I, we can definitely move on to the next question, but from my vantage point, some of the work I'm doing globally with, uh, with some investors is, is in fact, looking at what's worked um, from emerging markets and uh, where the ROA has been uh, in renewables and elsewhere and trying to actually both learn from that sort of World Bank view and apply that here in the US. But conversely, like Arun said, take that view of you know, the, the less well-off parts of the world and make sure that they too participate in the economy um, and aren't locked out. So my slingshot notion is definitely applicable outside the US. Thank you. 
So uh, we had uh, received numerous questions on nuclear. Uh, of course, in Illinois, as the birthplace of nuclear power, nuclear power generates approximately 50% of the state electricity, 20% over the entire US. In addition, the nuclear fleet provides 50% of the carbon-free electricity in the US. Most plants were built in between 1967 and 1990. If retired after a 60, 60 year lifetime, substantial replacement power sources will be needed. What do you see as taking their place? Okay, who, who's the question to? Arun, you can start. So I think I answered that in one of the comments that look, current nuclear, you know, the, the reason it is, it's in, a, it's in a difficult position because the wholesale price of electricity has come down to the point that the margins for nuclear have gone down. And so it's very hard for them to survive on a kind of a day-to-day -day basis. And if you don't preserve this current nuclear, there is no new nuclear. So I think, this, so this, we have to stop the bleeding now. And, and so as part of Secretary Moniz's advisory board and Michael remembers, we had a report on nuclear. Um, and the answer was that if you want to sustain the current nuclear, they need some help. This is the policy help that you know, Michael was talking about. They need some policy help. Now that could come from the federal side, which um, Senator um, uh, Alexander was trying to pursue, or it come from the state, which is where things have gone today. And the states with a lot of nuclear, the huge amount of jobs involved, and, um, and it is the largest source of carbon-free electricity. So I think that's the number one thing is to see if you can extend the licenses of the current nuclear with retrofits, making them, keeping them safe, et cetera, and doing it in a way that is cost-effective, that is, that, that is business. It, it actually runs as a business. Um, so that's one. So they need some help. And there is, while Kerry and I were in the transition team, we learned that the, there's a bill on the, uh, on the floor, in the, I believe in the House, and there's some support from the Senate, where they're trying to take on a case-by-case -case basis nuclear plants and see how much help they, can, they need to be able to sustain them. And unfortunately, they were giving it to the authority for EPA to decide, and EPA doesn't do nuclear, DOE does. So I think there needs to be a partnership between DOE and EPA to make sure that happens. Now that is number one, because otherwise there is no new nuclear. We have, just have to remember this. In the new nuclear side, once you sustain the current nuclear plants, there is some cost reduction that needs to happen. And, this, and the small modular nuclear plants were, were um, you know, they were launched, the, at least the program was launched with the idea of financing. It's easier because you don't need to put your whole bank on the line for a $10 billion gigawatt scale thing. It is much lower capital exposure when you have a 300 megawatt plant with a billion dollar um, you know, tank on it than a $10 billion. But the cost per watt of, you know, come bring it down to $8 a watt because it's, it's expensive today in the United States to build, to bring it down to two or three or $4 a watt would be the right move for the small modular nuclear plants in addition to the financing uh, ability. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is uh, regarding uh, uh, carbon sequestration and storage five to 10 years ago. Earth subsurface storage was a widely used promising possible technology for lowering atmospheric carbon dioxide. Pilot programs in Illinois and elsewhere seem to document the scale of the opportunity as well as identify risks. Are carbon dioxide sequestration and geological storage still considered vital option for abating climate change? Does the shift to the goal of net zero carbon emission add to the desire for carbon capture and storage? So, Gary? Yes, um, I think so. That's definitely part of the mix. And I, what I find terribly exciting, even this morning, just uh, reading a new news article about a a new, a new technology company that's that's growing and spinning off in this space. Um, Arun and I have had a chance to talk. There's definitely technology out there um, that's 
past vetting, which would be part of my uh, contribution to this and an important role for the, the lab, um, is to make sure that uh, folks who are interested in investing in this technology understand that it's legit, because there's a lot of question, which I think is the point of your question. Uh, but I do think it's exciting. I've seen everything from, you know, uh, futuristic sci-fi looking technology to things like paint, you know, carbon sequestering paint. I think it's exciting, um, but again, a good and appropriate role for our friends at Argonne and the National Lab Systems is to help the investment community understand that this is an opportunity. Thank you, Carrie. Um, next, next question for Michael. Most of current policy discussions focus on mitigation of greenhouse gas emission through deploying technologies like renewable energy, low or zero carbon technologies such as nuclear power, carbon capture and storage, and energy efficiencies, which will change global energy supply and demand dynamics. What do you think of adaptation measures, including geoengineering technologies? So on adaptation, uh, do you mean what cities and people and societies will do? Yeah, no, it's, uh, <clears throat> look, climate change is here. Uh, we don't have to wait for it anymore. It came uh, and we have to start readjusting our life. Uh, you know, <clears throat> ask, you know, try to buy an air conditioner in Seattle or Portland right now. I'm sure that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and that will be, uh, you know, there'll be lots of adaptation like that. And that's going to be central to how we all manage it. Uh, so there's no doubt. Uh, I guess you also asked about geoengineering. Yes. Uh, I understand people's misgivings about geoengineering. Um, I think the uh, climate challenge is so great that it would really be a you know a failure uh, if we didn't if we weren't really investing a lot in understanding uh, geoengineering better and what the costs and the benefits uh, of it might be. Uh, look, no one wants the break glass moment, uh, but uh, you know I I think a reasonable expectation is that there's a decent chance that we're going to hit the break glass moment with the climate. Uh, and we should have every tool ready for that moment. Uh, you know, it'll, we don't want to find out uh, when we need to break the glass. Uh, we don't want to find out, whoa, <laughs> 15 or 20 years ago, we should have really figured all this out. That's not the moment. So, and uh, I think geoengineering has lots of challenges associated with it. Uh, but I think it's, my, you know, again, I defer to Arun's technical knowledge here, but my sense is it's not very expensive, uh, at least several forms of it. Uh, and we should be trying to figure out what it can do and uh, what its challenges are. Arun, do you have any comments? Sure. I, I think the adaptation resilience part, I think it's very important to elevate the issue on par with mitigation because we already have climate change going on, where you see the Texas freeze, which was due to a unstable, what is called the Rossby wave in the, in the jet stream. Um, you know, you get, a, you get a polar vortex or a Texas freeze, and then you get these domes of heat waves that are happening. And we can't predict when the next the heat wave, where it's gonna happen. If you ask the question, where will the next heat wave be? We don't know which means everyone needs to be ready for this. And so raising the issue of adaptation resilience with science, engineering, and people in communities' um, goals in mind, I hope, I really hope that now that the word RPC has entered the lexicon, that that is something that they could use to develop, to strengthen the supply chains for food, for electricity, for, for water, or uh, other energy or other resources that communities use to have a community focus for adaptation resilience. So I think that's very important and that needs to be elevated um, to the level of mitigation because the, the, otherwise the risk is too high. On the geoengineering, as Michael pointed out, it's, we know it, we can do that. Volcanoes do that for us. 
um, every time a volcanic eruption happens, that in a massive one, the temperature comes down. In fact, we need to keep it ready in case there's a massive heat wave and there are thousands of people dying. And if you really want to get a, a fictional preview of this, read the book by um, Stan Robinson on the, the Ministry for the Future. And you will see it starts up in India where people are dying because it's just too hot and humid. And, and then all bets are off because you, people would like to use that. The question is, do we have the global governance for it? Because if you do that to reduce the temperature somewhere else, you'll have a massive rainfall somewhere else and people will die. So the question is a, is a moral, ethical and governance issue of how do you manage geoengineering because it's gonna affect everyone. And I, I think so the, not just the R&D, R&D should be done to find out what the, what the you know, sort of side impacts could be, but also the government, global governance issue. And this is where the United Nations could really play a role in bring the nations together. I hope this is discussed in Glasgow, at least not in, if not in Glasgow, at least in the future meetings. Thank you. We have a question for uh, Kerry from the audience. Uh, to promote consumer behavior change, can we go beyond economic benefits, incentives? What are your th thoughts on the required mix of financial versus societal incentives to promote behavior change by consumers? That is a great question and I'll try to answer it from a couple of different angles. I mean, from an investment perspective, the returns have to be there. Um, I just think, uh, we're at a place where um, that's just a fact. But uh, what I will encourage everyone to think about, and I often talk about it when I'm giving remarks, is I do think we're in this increased age of transparency and consumer demand and consumer lack of tolerance for greenwashing. Um, so I, I think we're, we're at that place and we're going to be heading more into that place without giving away all of my cards. That's something I actually am spending a pretty big chunk of my time on is the uh, disclosure transparency on the corporate side, um, both in terms of sort of the ESG content, if you will, supply chain, et cetera, but also on leadership. I know that isn't really part of what we're talking about today, but on diversity at the, in the leadership space um, and corporate. So I do think there's a pent up demand for this transparency. Um, and I, I, I predict, you know, more in interesting incentives I'm seeing a lot in the um, carbon offsets. I know that you guys are all probably paying close attention to that. I think that's another interesting space to watch um, how that's gonna be playing out uh, in the months ahead. Michael, you probably have some thoughts on this question too. Sure, uh, yeah, more than probably we have time for. But uh, on the transparency, I think that's super important uh, and getting, emissions out of the shadows and so that people are uh, are aware i would call that like uh you know like basic building block uh but it is not in and of itself uh like i, I the acid test i like to apply is like does the, does the planet care uh and i don't think the planet cares too much uh if we know and let me just pick on both of you how many tons of co2 uh, Carrie's household is responsible for versus Arun's uh, household. Uh, I think it's an important building block, but what the planet cares about is uh, that number going down. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't I, I fear that I sound like a broken record, but uh, the track record for getting that number to go down from any individual organization is really not so hot unless economics are in place. Uh, and so uh, making things transparent, very important. But like, if you put the acid test of does the planet care over it, uh, I'm, not, I'm not super confident uh, that the, in, by if you stop there, that that would be enough. Let me take this down to the ground level, Michael. Um, I would say I'm a pretty energy literate person. I definitely live in a boneheaded house for those purposes. Um, no thermal barrier, basically. What I know from my lived experience in Detroit and my work in the energy efficiency space at the residential level in a place that definitely needs, has an aged building stock, even when the incentives are there, um, we have other problems. 
um, just to, you guys, I, I opened on purpose with how I think about things. Um, I'll give you a, a fun fact that's actually not fun at all. Even when there's incentives for free retrofits in low income communities and communities of color, by the way, super impacted by COVID early on for those very reasons, there's a 75% walk away at the door because of other issues, mold, asbestos, no roof on the house, et cetera. So uh, incentives also are, just aren't sufficient. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you with that fun fact uh, about my home city, but um, I hear you, Michael. Yeah, no, no, I've written a paper about weatherization assistance in Michigan. Uh, it's hard to get people to do it, even when it's free. Uh, it, it's hard to get people. And then, you know, I'm a little, you know, I've started a nonprofit called Climate Vault, uh, to, which I think is meant to disrupt the offsets space. Uh, and because I feel like, uh, you know, what's the old thing? Insanity is when you have bad results and you keep doing the same thing over and over. Uh, that's kind of where we are with offsets. Uh, it's, it's the, you know, what I'm astonished by uh, is uh, that people are surprised that the forest projects are failing to deliver because uh, they've been failing to deliver for a quarter century uh, since uh, the clean development mechanism and uh, coming out of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, and so I, I think we need to take a fresh look uh, at providing pathways or ways for individuals and organizations to act on their totally laudable goal of voluntarily reducing their uh, carbon footprint. And as I said, I have started a nonprofit that I believe uh, ha is uh, the better mousetrap, but that's not for discussion today. Okay, can I just make an appeal to Argonne National Lab? I think yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to repeat what Michael and Kerry said. I think the disclosure of enterprises, corporations, the carbon disclosure is a very important. It's a first step. It's very important. But in the disclosure, there needs to be not just the scope one emissions or the scope two emissions, which are easy, but the scope three emissions, which are often the dominant. Uh, amount. If you look at Microsoft, in fact, we've had public discussion with Microsoft. They've made a net zero uh, commitment and they, they're disclosing in the SEC filings every year <laughs> with the revenues and all the carbon. You ask them, how do you calculate scope three emissions? And no one really has an idea. Well accepted industry-wide standard of how to do that. So here's an appeal to Argonne National Lab and to the others, national labs and the like coming up with a well-accepted way to measure and estimate scope three emissions. So because it is, if I have a banana in the morning today, that has scope three emissions. And how do you evaluate that with the error bars, with uncertainty? And I think it's gonna be very, very important if you are to disclose and do something with it. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And it was really a wonderful discussion. Thank you, uh, Aaron, Kerry, and Michael for really showing us what a decarbonized future might look like and how we would get there. This really has been fun. I learned a lot and I hope we can pick up this discussion in the future. Uh, in closing, well, I learned a lot. So there are key messages. I think we are a little bit you know, out of time. So I will just go ahead and close. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank Linda and Paul for kicking off this virtual event as well as our great speakers today, Aaron, Kerry, and Michael. And I appreciate your willingness to bring this topic to life at Argonne. To our audience, thank you for joining us today for the third installment of the Director's Special Colloquium Series, celebrating Argonne's 75th year of the pivotal science and technology discoveries that accelerate US prosperity and security. We hope you will join us throughout the year at additional events, Please visit anl.gov slash events to learn more or anl.gov slash subscribe to sign up for notification. To conclude this event, we have a special short video celebrating our anniversary. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of, the, of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
Argonne National Laboratory plays a vital role in our everyday lives, forging tools and technology to help improve and shape the world around us. Whether we're designing fuel-efficient engines that produce fewer emissions and help fight climate change, or identifying weaknesses in deadly viruses that lead to the design of treatments and vaccines, our research addresses some of the world's most important science and technology questions and pursues solutions to everyday problems. Born of the Manhattan Project, Argonne was chartered as a national laboratory in 1946, dedicated to pioneering the development of nuclear technology for peaceful uses. The laboratory's legacy of developing new energy sources has expanded to cover an awe-inspiring range of research areas. From computational sciences that merge innovative data and analysis tools to solve complex problems, to X-ray sciences that illuminate how materials are structured and how they work, both here on Earth and beyond, to the materials sciences that develop safer, more reliable materials for batteries, engine parts, and more. But solving society's grand challenges requires leadership, knowledge, a diverse workforce, and powerful tools. Argonne is home to five Department of Energy user facilities that support the research of nearly 8,000 scientists every year, enabling science at tremendous scale. Each facility provides unique tools and world-class expertise to support industry, academia, and other research institutions globally. With future upgrades of two of our facilities, the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility and the Advanced Photon Source, we are poised to transform scientific discovery and innovation, opening doors to exciting new technologies and greater insight into ourselves, our planet, and the cosmos. 75 years after its charter, Argonne continues to pursue its mission to provide the nation with clean, efficient energy sources and drive research that enables energy independence and protects our critical infrastructure in the face of natural disasters. And as society's engagement with technology evolves, Argonne continues to accelerate science in partnership with businesses and universities to revolutionize scientific discovery through artificial intelligence further our understanding of energy and matter in the universe, harness the quantum world, and advance manufacturing to strengthen our economy and national security. For 75 years, Argonne has met the scientific and technical challenges of the day, and today, more than ever, we want to assure our actions benefit everyone equally. We continue our efforts in STEM outreach to underserved communities and to increase diversity and inclusivity at our laboratory and beyond. We work to assure that the results of clean energy research benefit people of all backgrounds and that all communities are resilient against the effects of climate change. Challenges may change in the future, but Argonne's commitment to excellence in discovery and innovation and dedication to a just society will not. This is Argonne transforming science, improving your life.